Prick up your earballs. It's time for the power movement. <laughs> Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week has been a really crazy and heavy week in my life. Where do I start? I guess last week, I was finishing up recording the intro for the Andy Mayer episode. I decided to walk downstairs to check out the mail because I had some jawbreakers that I bought off eBay coming in. They didn't arrive, and I walked back upstairs to my studio, and I realized I missed a FaceTime call from my mom. This is unusual. So I FaceTime her back, and the phone is put in front of my dying grandmother, one of the most influential people in my life, Mimi Dell. She's in a hospice bed and looks rough. She's with it enough to understand what's going on, and I can tell that she hears me, and I have a minute to tell her how much I love her and how much she's done for me. It all happens so fast, and I go from zero to ugly crying in the snap of my fingers. I get off the phone. My wife is already packing me and booking me a one-way ticket to D.C., We leave the house 15 minutes later. The airport was amazing. I felt totally safe. Alaska knows what they are doing, and everyone's respectful of masks and distancing, which is super important. I mean, I've been so careful about not going out and getting this virus, and now I'm pretty much throwing that all out the window, getting on a plane and going to a place where my mom, my uncle, my aunt, and a lot of older people that I don't want to get sick, well, they're going to be there, and they're not going to be wearing masks. I mean, we were at our house with hospice nurses and family, and it was exactly what Mimi Dell wanted, just like we were for my grandfather six years ago, to see her last breath. And when you sit and stare at death for hours and hours at a time, it makes you think a lot about death. I did a lot of wondering about if Mimi Dell was seeing her life pass by. Could she hear all of the family members who were there? Are you scared? And those are the normal thoughts. But based on what I have seen in life, it also made me think about the people I have known to die. And most of them were really young. We always would say, oh, they went out doing what they love. But the more I think about it, that's total bullshit. Sure, they love what they were doing, but they died. You know who had a much better life than all the people I know who have passed? Those people that were doing gnarly shit? Mimi Dell did. She traveled the world countless times over, flew the Concorde, and enjoyed the best of everything. She never compromised fashion for comfort. She had impeccable taste, and she was a boss. And she was able to have a family on top of all that. Three kids, seven grandkids, one great-grandkid. Mimi Dell never got rad, but she lived. And I guess that's the most important thing. Staying alive, not just for you, but for the people that care about you. I am sure going to miss my Mimi Dell. She was truly one of a kind. Another one of a kind person is my guest this week, Barrett Christie. A living snowboard legend. I was originally planning on putting Barrett's episode up in a few weeks as she was on another podcast recently, and I wanted to give that a little room to breathe. But then the whole Mimi Dell situation came up, and I postponed some interviews and decided to run with Barrett, who is every bit of a badass as Mimi Dell was, but Barrett's a way better snowboarder. Barrett is one of the most decorated snowboarders of all time, and she was a late bloomer getting into the sport, which makes it a very interesting story. Before we get into Barrett, I need to ask you to do a few things for me. First, I want you to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to it, Also, please follow me on Instagram at The Powell Movement. And finally, please support my amazing sponsors. They are Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Stanley, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Cole Headwear. I'd also like you to think about my Mimi Dell for a second. And now, let's talk to Barrett Crispy. You are married to Temple Cummins, another legend in snowboarding, and you two have children. Do they have superhuman snowboard powers? (laughs) Yeah, I think so. I My son, Cannon, is just about to turn 16. He's a really good snowboarder. I think he got his skills from daddy, though. He's got strong legs, and he has that like fluid style where he looks at terrain and, and surfs it really fluidly. And so it's fun to watch him snowboard and to play with him. And then Isla's 11, and she just likes to go fast. So I wouldn't say she's like, obsessed with snowboarding but she has fun with it gotcha so the boy has more of like the froth and she's just like into it because that's part of what the family does yeah there's a lot of things she does because it's part of what the family does i think she froths over gymnastics and like contortionist sort of stuff she's really flexible 
but I wouldn't say she's frothing over snowboarding, but she likes it. And when you were a kid, I guess you weren't really snowboarding when you were a kid, but in other people and thinking when they're a kid, they don't really think of the emotions that parents have towards what their kids are doing, like being in risky situations. Cannon, he likes to get out there and I'm sure he's taking risks. You were a pro for a long, long time. And now you have a kid who's taking risks like you did back then. Does it like worrisome? Yeah, of course it is. I think I worry more about skateboarding because he skates a lot and he's getting to the point where he like doesn't wear his helmet as often as I think he should. But uh, he has concrete driveway at our house that he skates tight transitions on and he's really good. So I worry about him, but I also have a lot of confidence in him. And I think about that all the time because my mom went through hell. She wasn't familiar with snowboarding at all. She just saw me probably for the first time snowboarding at a contest at the U.S. Open or at the X Games in Vermont. And she was horrified. She, Of course, I crashed. And of course, she had to sit through that. And she's a warrior anyway. So I think it was really tough for her. So sorry, mom. <laughs> but now I know how she felt a little bit. But totally different animal for her because like you're from Pennsylvania, I think Bucks County. And yeah. you didn't snowboard when you were younger. It's not like that's what she had to worry about. You were more of a gymnast, I think. Was that your first love? Yeah, for sure. I grew up doing gymnastics and, you know, then I played field hockey, lacrosse, team sports. And when I moved out at 18, it took me a couple of years before, or I think the next year I started snowboarding about 19. And so all of that was away from home. So she really didn't know. She just knew that that was the reason I was in the mountains because I found something I liked to do. And I was probably following boys around and just sort of being independent for the first time in my life. And so I don't think they realized how seriously I was taking it until a few years later when I ended up in a contest on the East Coast and they could come see. Speaking of family, is it mom and dad together, brothers and sisters, rich, poor, average? How was that growing up? Well, mom and dad were together until just probably the last year I was home. So about 17, they split. They still live close by and they're still pretty close. My brother lives around Philadelphia too. So nobody's moved, just me. And Bucks County is kind of an affluent place. We weren't affluent by any means, but we were, you know, living a pretty comfortable suburban lifestyle. And there was a lot of farm country around and it was really comfortable. It was nice. My parents weren't risk takers. I wasn't really given much independence. I couldn't go to the shore by myself. And they kept me in a pretty tight rein compared to how our children have the freedom now. But I, as soon as I could, I was out and I just headed west and just enjoyed my first independent missions at 18. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you headed west right when you could because in high school, you play team sports, field hockey and lacrosse. Field hockey is the one you're really, really good at good enough to get a college scholarship to Appalachian State, and you don't take it or you don't go. Why not? I did a drive-by through Appalachian State on the way to California and was just on a road trip with friends, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do with college, and hockey and lacrosse weren't enough of a passion of mine to hook me for four years at a school just to play. And it all just seemed like too much of a big step. So I couldn't envision myself there either. When I imagined leaving home and heading to the mountains, it wasn't to Boone. It was to bigger mountains and just exploring the country more before I settled in anywhere. Did you know you wanted to be in the mountains? Like, did you ski in the Poconos a bunch when you were a kid growing up? I skied a little bit. My friend's family would take me to Hunter or Smuggler's Notch. I went on a trip up there, but... I mean, I could probably count on two hands the number of times I went skiing. And my dad took me a couple times too. But I just wanted to be in the mountains just because, you know, I went on an outward bound course when I was, it was my graduation present. So right after high school, my mom got that for me. She sensed that like I wanted to explore more and, and learn more about different areas. And so that was something I really wanted to do. And and that was three weeks in the mountains that kind of sparked my interest to go there a little deeper. So you're not like the typical kid from Bucks County who's all about the Eagles, the Flyers, and all that kind of stuff. You just want to get out right when high school's over? 
<laughs> yeah, I wasn't trying to escape anything negative. I just felt the urge to explore. But no, I was I wasn't really Eagles, Flyers, Phillies. It wasn't my thing. No. Nope. And when you road trip out west, I mean, I think I read somewhere that it was like you were in a VW bus and you were going dead show to dead show. And were you living that lifestyle? Was it like, hey, I'm not going to go to school. I'm just going to do what every 18-year-old wishes they could do? Um, that was the lifestyle. But, you know, I, I had a couple trips west. And I did travel in a bus with my friend. And we did go to a bunch of dead shows. But then we caravanned. Eventually, I earned money waitressing and had my own car. And it was like Dodge Colt that I thought was perfect. It was a little hatchback. I could sleep in it. I fit everything I owned in it. And yeah, we went to dead shows, but it, that wasn't really the only mission. That was just part of the fun. So you weren't like selling veggie burritos and twirling in the parking lot and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> I don't know. I did spend a lot of time in the parking lot. I definitely didn't get into every show, but I enjoyed the, you know, it was like the festival lifestyle. I enjoyed it. It was fun. And were you full on hippie? Like when you looked at you, did you have like the hemp necklace with a glass blown thing in the middle and just like look dirty hippie. I don't know. I don't think so. I, I was probably pretty dirty, but I don't think I had a hemp necklace. Actually, I had beads though. Yep. Tie dyes. It's funny how it's the same thing is still in style today. I mean, I'd still see people with tie dye dead shirts all over the place. It's cool again. You could be kitted out from head to toe in licensed Grateful Dead product. Dude, right now, it's so crazy how much licensed product in the past year and a half. I know. I saw the dog rain jacket yesterday that <laughs> they make like 17 different sizes and they're like four different Grateful Dead logoed dog rain jackets. You know, there's obviously <laughs> the ski and snowboard movies and the 12 products in our category, but it's amazing. Because they've been selective over the years, it seems like, of like, we'll do this cool thing and we'll do that cool thing. And now they're just like, we'll take all the money. Yeah, somebody sold out. Yeah. But <laughs> so you head out west and I think you eventually end up in Santa Cruz, but that might be too expensive. And then it's up to Tahoe and that becomes home base. And is that like the fall after high school? The fall after high school, I went to visit friends in Tahoe and then... The next year, I moved to Santa Cruz, but would visit Tahoe every weekend. So I was back and forth, but I, I had friends from high school that were a little older than me that moved to Tahoe the year before me. So I always had friends to go stay with, and eventually I just moved in with them and eight dudes in a two-bedroom A-frame cabin in South Lake. You're not like a full-on ski bum or anything like that. It's not like you moved from the East Coast to go ski out West. But skiing something you're going to do in the mountains, I would think. Or do you just get on a snowboard right away once you start seeing it? Oh, I tried. You know, I thought skiing was pretty cool. And I kind of fantasized about skiing in my neon gear and my old skis. I didn't realize how hard it was to ski when you got off the ice that I was used to. So as soon as I got into more than a couple inches of powder, I was flailing and I'd lose my skis, lose my poles. And just felt like I was completely out of my element. And that was the first time I saw snowboarding. People were floating on top of the snow instead of getting stuck under it. And it just looked like, oh, if I'm going to be struggling, I might as well struggle with something new that looks fun. <laughs> looks like way more rewarding. So that's when I switched. And when you make the switch, for a lot of people, it's three days of pain. But I don't think you make it three days. What happens on day one on a snowboard for you? <laughs> it sounds like you've read this story before. I've heard a little bit here and there. Yeah, I went, I have a friend of mine took me snowboarding at Boreal. I think they opened really early. They blew snow. It was like, I want to say end of October even. And I tried snowboarding and they didn't really like nobody gave me lessons they just like got me set up on a board showed me how to put my bindings on and tried to explain that you want to turn and use your edges but I was just on my own on this little man-made icy snow hill and I cracked my tailbone that first day so of course I kept riding I don't even know which slam it was there were so many but the next day I couldn't sit or walk and yeah that was day one snowboarding when you say cracked your tailbone, I mean, is it just a hard fall or is it something that you got x-rayed for and you really cracked your tailbone? I got x-rayed eventually, but I didn't have insurance and I wasn't about to go spend my money on 
an x-ray. So I sat on a pillow for a while. I want to say the next year, probably something else happened. There was another reason I got x-rayed. It was maybe for my hip, but then they said, oh, you know, you have a broken tailbone. There's a chip off of it and just floating around in there. Like, yeah, I knew it hurt really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I did it again years later. So that's fun. <laughs> so when you crack your tailbone like that, is it just are you out of commission for like a couple weeks sitting on a pillow and then you get right back on the horse again? Or do you go back to skiing for a bit? Or is it like you're fully committed to snowboarding? No, I was pretty committed. I was determined to figure it out. So it been because it was so early season. I mean, I think there was probably three months where I didn't snowboard. I didn't even get a chance to try again. So I was going to community college and working full time. And eventually I got a pass at Kirkwood. And that's where I had to try to figure out snowboarding for real. And yeah, there was probably a few months where I didn't go. But I definitely wasn't somebody who snowboarding came easy to. I hadn't really ever skateboarded. I'm sure I tried to push around on a road a couple times, but I wasn't a sideways sport person. So all of it just felt really foreign and it took a while. But when I got my mind set to it, I didn't want to give up. So I kept going no matter what the cost. <laughs> so at this point, you're like 19, 20 years old and you've done a lot. You finished high school. You've done your little dead tours or mini tours or whatever you're doing back then. You start doing the ski or even worse, become like a snowboard bum thing. What do your parents think about these life choices and direction of yours? Or are they like hippies and <laughs> like, hey, she'll figure it out? Yeah, they weren't hippies. <laughs> they were pretty conservative East Coast. They wanted me to go to college. But, you know, I also didn't have like a college fund rolled out for me to go. So I knew that if I was going to go, I had to pay for it myself. And That's bullshit. I totally agree with you. I figured if I was going to pay for it myself, I better know what I want to do when I grow up, when I start college. And unfortunately, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, you know, so that sort of held me back. But I was going to community college to try and like keep going, I actually try to get my California residency so I could go to another school. I had it in the back of my mind, but it wasn't my top priority. And then I moved to Colorado after two seasons in Tahoe and moved to Crested Butte. And I did go to college at Western State in Gunnison. And, and that's where I felt like I really learned to snowboard much better in Crested Butte and really found a community that I felt like was everything I was looking for. And, you know, worked at night, rode during the day and had a few days of school a week. And had to go sit in classes, you know, there was no such thing as remote schooling. So I had to just be there. And the minute that I had got an opportunity to go do something for a sponsor, I've hooked up with LibTech with our Rocky Mountain rep at the time, gave me a snowboard and really encouraged me and thought he saw something in me for snowboarding. And so that started to take off a little bit. And I couldn't do school and do that because my grades were falling. So that's where my college career ended at the time. And Crested Butte is like the college for you in snowboarding. I mean, that's where you figure everything out riding wise. And I think the thing with you, too, is you had so many years of gymnastics that once you figure out getting in the air, is everything comfortable again? Like once you figure out how to snowboard? Yeah, I think so. I think that's why Crested Butte was great, because there were no parks and pipes at the time. There really weren't even a lot of snowboarders. You know, Colorado Border was the snowboard shop, and it was a pretty tight community of snowboarders living there, but not a ton. And so the whole mountain was like my snowboard education, and I had to go fast and keep up with my friends that were skiers and learn how to traverse and manage the rocky terrain and jump off of rocks. And, you know, we weren't stopping to build kickers very often anyway. <laughs> and we rode great snow and pretty challenging terrain. And so when I got to the point where I dropped in a pipe or off a jump for the first time, I felt like, oh, this is pretty easy compared to the variable conditions in Crested Butte and the jumps I was hitting there off the natural terrain. So it, it definitely felt like more comfortable and easy to progress when I finally did learning how to use my edges and learning how to control my speed and manage turns was really the best foundation for any of the jumping stuff. Yeah, you went to one of the more challenging mountains, if not the most resort-wise in Colorado. Lots of steep stuff and 
your career was made, you know, people know you for contests, but your foundation was all based out of Crested Butte and you're kind of in a bubble there. So when you're there in school, you're not really leaving there. Everything's all about Crested Butte. So you're not really getting a chance to even go check out the parks. But are you fully like involved in the scene of snowboarding at the time? Like watching the Weather Channel every night, watching snowboard movies and then beer and bong rips mixed in? (laughs) Probably most of the above. But yeah, once I did tap into going to a few trips to Summit County and doing a couple contests, then I was hooked. And and it didn't take long before I left Crested Butte and moved to Vail, Breckenridge Vail. I was back and forth between the two for a little while and then settled in Vail for 10 years. And yeah, I was completely obsessed with the snow conditions. And even when I was doing the contests, it would just tear me up, obviously, if I knew it was snowing at home and I couldn't be there because all I wanted to do was ride powder. But, you know, the contests were fun too. It just, that still wasn't the only reason I was snowboarding. Now it's time for me to take a sponsor break. And my first sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing the Northwest's best beer and supporting all things ski, snowboard, and bike since 2006. When I say their beer is the best, I really mean that. Recently, I've been drinking Nature Calls Mountain IPA. And not only does it have the best name in beer, a portion of the proceeds benefits the Conservation Alliance, so it does make a difference. And as far as supporting action sports, no other beer comes close to what Ten Barrel does for ski, snowboard, and bike. Next time you're at the store, pick up a six-pack of Ten Barrel and support the beer that supports the sports we love, the Ten Barrel Brewery. My next sponsor is Stanley. You know, the brand that has been around for over 100 years, the ones that invented that keep things hot and keep things cold category. Back in the day, you could count on your grandpa's green Stanley to keep the hot chocolate soups and so much more hot. Well, these days, Stanley still makes that same green bottle, and they also make so many more products that will keep your liquids hotter and colder for a couple hours longer than any other product on the market. You know I think you deserve the best for less, and I'm going to make that happen again at Stanley. To save 30% on all Stanley products, Head on over to stanley-pmi.com, go shopping, head to checkout, enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all one word, all lowercase, and you're good to go. You'll save 30%. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. You're in Crested Butte, and eventually you go on a solo mission to Summit County. I don't know if it's Breck or wherever it is, but you go to your first pipe contest, and is it just something like you read about or hear about, and you're like, I'm going to go, and no one else in your crew even once is interested? And you go solo? I think I did go solo to the first one. I mean, right away, the first time I went to Breckenridge and did a pipe contest, it was a Rocky Mountain series. There was like two in a row over the course of a weekend. The first one, I think there was probably only five girls and I got third. And so I was pretty encouraged. And then the second one, I did a lot better. And I just figured out, I mean, the pipes were eight foot walls, right? They weren't anything like what you have to navigate now. But still, it was at the time, you know, there were some pretty good riders there. And I met my friend Rhonda Doyle that first weekend, and she made snowboarding seem so inviting and so much fun that I wanted to be a part of it. You know, I could have had a very different experience if snowboarders weren't nice that I joined up with, and I may have been turned away and done something different. You know, it it was really cool that Rhonda became one of my closest friends, and I moved in with her in Vail the next year. So, yeah, I had a good first experience, and I think it was solo. I may I had a couple friends that would go on the trips with me sometimes from Crested Butte, but like I said, it didn't take long before I just moved and lived in Vail. Because it sounded like when you were commuting, you were like borrowing a van, and you looked like the homeless yeah. dirty girl in and out of the <laughs> van going to contests. Selling I did. stuff. I borrowed a van. The, one of the owners of Colorado Border lent me his big van. And funny thing is, is he also owned like a thrift store in Gunnison. So he had like a barn full of old clothes that he said, well, why don't you fill up the van with some old stuff? You can take it, throw a yard sale at a friend's house in Boulder, make some money, and you can use that money to pay for your travel. And you can stay in the van. And I thought that was brilliant. So I filled this van up to the roof with like old clothes that had been living in their barn for who knows how long and went down and set up a yard sale in Boulder at a friend's house. And I was riding for Wave Rave at the time. 
Trey Cook was the guy who had a house he had rented there. And I did a yard sale there. I made like 400 bucks. I slept in the van. <laughs> I met Dave England. Matt Remine was there. He was our rep at the time that had given me my first board. And those were my friends. And it was so much fun. And I thought this was genius. I could do this everywhere across the country. But then the van broke down. And then they got in trouble for having a dirty hippie in a van and a yard sale in the front yard of a nice home in Boulder. So <laughs> that was the only time I did it. But... <laughs> Have you ever been, for lack of better term, like a girly girl? Like, have you ever gone out and gotten your hair done, dressed up, and do all your makeup and stuff like that? Does that ever happen in your life? You mean now or then? Then, now, ever. I don't know. I mean, I don't know you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. I did. I like to go to the bar, and I like to go to the dance club, and I like to dress up, too. I mean, there was probably a time where I didn't have money to go out even if I wanted to, nor did I have money to buy clothes. But at some point, I figured out how to pull it even without a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My daughter would get so bummed now, though. She just wants me to wear all my old dresses and fancy high heels. And she's a girly girl. She wants me to dress up. And I just now it's hard to find a reason to want to do that. But back to dirtbagging it, you go to 94 Nationals, you qualify after one of your trips. What's that event like? Is it just like another Sunday at your local hill with a couple banners or is this actually a big deal? Because this is early in snowboarding, I feel like. Yeah, 94 Nationals and Vail. I think it was 94. I qualified by doing those first two pipe events in Breckenridge the month before. So that's all it took to qualify. And so I went to Nationals was probably my third time riding pipe. And it was awesome. I mean, that's where people came from all over. And I just, I entered the open class and I ended up winning the pipe contest. And so that was pretty exciting for me. I don't remember much about whether there were TV cameras or probably just the Veil Daily was there, but it's cool. I still have the start list from that event and there's so many names, like Temple was there and I didn't know Temple then, but there's so many awesome pro snowboarder names on that list that were there probably in the juniors or Minahoonies or whatever the little kid categories are. But yeah, that was awesome. And I didn't feel the need to ride pipe a whole lot right away after that. I just felt like I did it. I crossed the contest thing off my list and I wanted to go do more free riding. And I did some extreme contests that brought me back to Crested Butte and took me to Alaska. And then uh, eventually kind of got back into it again. You went to Alaska that early in your career, like 95, 96? Yeah, the um, King of the Hill, when I think Julie Zell and Matt Goodwill won. I mean, Sean Farmer was there. That must have been insane. Just being around Sean Farmer, one, has got to be insane. But just <laughs> going from you start snowboarding at 19 years old, you're probably 24, 25 going to Alaska for the first time. That's got to be intimidating as shit, I would think. Yeah, it was. It was definitely intimidating. And I don't think I ever adjusted to it. I mean, we got dropped off at the top of some run, which in hindsight was pretty mellow, but I had kind of eyed up what I wanted to do. And then, of course, had no experience like visualizing a run from the top of a mountain or taking Polaroids at the time or anything to judge where I was coming down. And I'm lucky I didn't Go. I mean, I went the wrong way and I ended up just missing the whole section. So it was mellow Alaska runs. But it was, yeah, it was just so big and so much more intense than I expected. But it was a cool experience. And yeah, I don't, I don't think contests in Alaska, I wasn't really cut out for that. The combination of the pressure and not being able to fully enjoy the moment was a little tough. But luckily, I had a few other opportunities after that to go up. I just think it's so early in your career at that point. It's like you haven't been able to live every aspect of snowboarding. Like a lot of people build their way up to Alaska. Like they have to go through contests and they get good enough in contests where their sponsors let them film. Then they start filming for a while and then eventually they get the call to go to Alaska and that's when everything gets real for them and then they want to go back every whenever they can. And you go very early in your career, which is amazing. How about Hood? When do you start going there and making snowboarding a year-round thing? The first time I went to Hood was 95, maybe, because I drove out and slept in my car and hiked up, didn't have lift tickets, and met the park builder at High Cascade and had permission to hit the big jump only when nobody else was hitting it. So 
I took any opportunity I could to ride there. I got to do a photo shoot there as well. I might have spent a whole summer there, somewhere around 96 or 97. I could be off by a year or so. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's a podcast. But yeah, I mean, that was that was amazing. And as far as the Alaska stuff goes, I think because I did the first U.S. extremes were in Crested Butte. Yep. And I won those, but granted, I spent a couple of years in Crested Butte and knew the terrain really well. So that was just my whole mountain on a powder day. And it was pretty fun and easy to find the lines that did well. And so I think that is what got me the opportunity to go to Alaska early on. But yeah, then, you know, went to Hood a few times and then X Games started in 97. So I kind of turned my focus to that stuff and really was just doing anything I had the opportunity to do. And, and when that opportunity came up, it also came with the potential to make some money. So that's where I went. Yeah. I would think like right around when X Games comes around, they're also talking about snowboarding might be in the Olympics in 98 at Nagano. People are talking about that. It's definitely going to be in the X Games. And is this when you realize that there is a path for you in snowboarding? Or has that happened? I think before that, you might end up at the US Open. Was the US Open before the X Games that first win for you? Yeah, 97, 98 were just were good years, you know, and then the Olympics in 98 came up and, you know, it was only half pipe, which I did well in some pipe events, but I was also doing big air and slope style was coming up at the time too. So I'd say that that's probably where I was more consistent, but pipe was the opportunity to go to the Olympics. So I tried to turn my focus to that. Yeah. But before that, you go to Vermont for the US Open, which is like, yeah. The biggest event in snowboarding and probably the biggest event that you've ever been a part of at that point. I mean, you've done like the 94 Nationals, you've done some other contests, but when you get to the U.S. Open, is that the biggest thing you've ever seen where there's 15 people deep at the pipe just watching this event? Yeah, you know, the first time I did go to the U.S. Open, I didn't qualify. That's when it was really an Open and it was open to everybody in like a week of qualifying. And so... I didn't make it very far in the qualifying rounds the first time I went to the Open. So I had a taste of it from that perspective. And it was something I definitely wanted to be a part of. And it was just that whole community of snowboarders together and the fans and like everybody that came to watch the event was so incredibly psyched. And it was such a cool energy. So I really wanted to get back. And I don't know if it was the next year, might have been 96 when I went back. And I did okay. And then 97, I did well in 98. So yeah, I mean, until the X Games, the Open was that big event. And they were so different anyway. I mean, the Open was really like snowboarding focused, whereas the X Games had a whole bunch of other sports, but it was a much more intense like media scene that I hadn't experienced prior to that. Is the Open the first time where you're really competing against your idols? Yeah, probably. Uh huh. Oh, you know what? That brings back of memory there used to be a mount hood open and it wasn't a burton open event but it was the mount hood open and i think that might have been the first time i competed against michelle taggart tina bassage was there shannon dunn and Jana mayan was there too and i looked up to all those girls and i'd seen them in the magazines and once again like they were so friendly and it was such a cool fun experience that there was no vibing and there was no intensity that was scary it was just everybody kind of feeding off each other in in a mini pipe pretty much but yeah those were my idols and they turned out to be really good friends and nice people you know you back then it seemed like a, i'm going to talk about women in snowboarding and equality per se or whatever but back then it didn't seem like equality was an issue because i was snowboarding back then and it seemed like the names that you say tina michelle shannon all the brands had women. They might not have had a ton of them, but they had women that were badass and they marketed just like the men. They had pro models just like the men. And every scene seemed pretty equal, in my opinion, as like a fan who was buying the magazines and stuff. And eventually I think that changes, but did it seem pretty equal to you back then? Yeah. I mean, I've thought about this a lot lately, but snowboarding did seem really open. And I used to get asked this question a lot from like mainstream media when it was like, oh, you're one of a few girls. How is it? Do you have to fight for the attention? And I never felt like I had to do that with snowboarding as a snowboarder. It was 
pretty open and you know there were much fewer girls on the hill in any given contest than there are now so i mean the opportunity to stand out was it was a lot easier and get recognized by sponsors and all of us were you know jana was younger but you know shannon and tina and michelle were about my age so we were pretty mature independent women that have already been like adulting for a little while so it was easy we all had good relationships with our sponsors and we were in at an opportune time to develop product and influence how the industry marketed to women and so it was you know the timing was great and the sport was growing and i think that you know, it was pretty wide open for women to be involved at that point. Was there a a difference in pay between women and men? I mean, you're winning all the contests. And is your equivalent like Todd Richards, he's winning contests as well back then. Is Todd going to make more money than you because he's a man? Well, I think Todd probably did make more money than me. He made some smart business decisions along the way too. Okay, well, maybe he's not the best example because he made great business decisions. But let's think of someone who made average business decisions that were winning (laughs) contests at the time. And were they getting paid more than you? You know, yeah. I mean, not every prize purse was equal. That's for sure. Most of them weren't. So yeah, the guys were earning more money. And I'd say from the majority of sponsors, there was more money for the top guys than the top girls. So yeah, I mean, that's been an issue all throughout. However, I had opportunities and I'd say that at the time when mainstream companies started to get interested in snowboarding, a lot of them preferred to work with myself as a woman because it was such a unique place to be as a snowboarder. And so I had bigger sponsor opportunities, I'd say partly because I was a woman over some of the guys and that helped me make more money at the time. And I would think one of the things that's different is just there are events that you have to beg to be a part of. I'm sure there's big airs that they're not going to let you in and just some things that are men's only events that you happen to be at. And you're just like, dude, let me hit the jump. Yeah, there was a lot of that in the beginning because we did a big air at the X Games in 97. And that was the first time a lot of us had even hit a jump like that. And it wasn't built that great. It just kicked you up in the air for a show. And it Landing was terrible, and it was a really narrow runway. But at the time, we were psyched, and and I think they included a deep list of 10 to 15 girls to hit it. And it came down to just five of us, I think, doing the finals or doing it at all because it was was so new. And I remember just thinking, well, you know, back to comparing my, my snowboarding to what I had to do in Crested Butte and the challenges there, I felt like, oh, hitting a jump that is somewhat predictable and I know that there's no rocks hiding under the landing. Like, I got this. This is easier than extreme snowboarding at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so it felt like, I, you know, I'd figure it out and didn't ever really have a deep bag of tricks. But the fact that I was willing to hit the jumps and had air awareness, I think, got me pretty far. So it sounds like there was some inequality back then, but no one ever felt the need to have to speak out on behalf of women because it wasn't really something terrible yet although it was something that was happening. And then if you fast forward a few years, I look at it now as like, or maybe not now, but I look at it years after you, it seemed like women were almost props where like all the action in the ads would be men doing gnarly stuff. And then you'd have a picture of a woman holding a snowboard or a pair of skis. I mean, I feel like that's where it started getting different. And that's where someone really needs to start fighting for rights. Where did you see the road split and it get a little bit different for women? You know, I think that my experience early on may have been very different from others. You know, I did have opportunities because I was a woman and that did help me cash in on some higher paid sponsors at the time. So I did pretty well. But I think that there was always a little bit of a struggle to be taken seriously and to be considered a elite level rider as a woman because there was always the guys that were going bigger or farther or in their opinion, faster, and they looked better. (laughs) So they had more opportunities to take photos and to film. And like photographers wanted to get with the men more than the women, I think, as a whole, just because there was a better show. But it's hard to say. I don't know at what point that changed. I think when mainstream media went outside of the industry, outside of the heart, the culture core companies got into snowboarding and saw an opportunity there. You had 
like some of the big mainstream companies come in, like Reef, for example, coming in and like then suddenly the girls in the ads were in bikinis. They were butt shots. And that's just one example. But that starts it, you know, and it just keeps it down that path. Yeah. Well, and I think it's like anything when you have businesses that spring up because they see an opportunity in the sport, but they're not connected to the culture in any way, then they have more money to project the images that they align with and excuse the industry to their side, you know? And I don't think that everybody was aware of the women that had been instrumental in shaping the sport from the beginning. So a lot of these bigger companies may have come in and not given the spotlight to the ladies. Yeah. Well, and speaking of big companies that sell out some of the sport and don't really understand everything about the sport, I guess the biggest part of your whole career has been the X Games, and they come in in 97. And while they do understand the sport now, I'm sure when they get in and have super modified shovel racing and things like that, (laughs) there are some weird things going on there. But that's got to be like the biggest honor of your early career, I would think, is getting an invite to the X Games. Like, do you remember where you were when you got a phone call or a letter that said you're coming to this event? Or do you have to qualify? I don't remember. I don't know. I think that it was the biggest moment just to show up at that event and win two medal or win big air and slope style was a first for me. And to do it on that type of stage was pretty awesome. And I don't remember how the invites went down. It may have been like somebody in the industry on a selection committee. And yeah, it was wacky. They had shovel racing. They had downhill snow mountain biking. I think they had like the twirly airborne snowboard ballerina. Sky surfing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that was a good one. They had a lot of weird sports in the beginning. I think speed climbing. I guess that would would have been summer. Yeah, that's true. Eventually the ice speed ice climbing too in Crested Butte the next year. But that first one at Snow Summit, I mean, it seemed pretty good. I, I know that they had, I mean, I want to say Gunny was building the jumps, building the course. Like they had people from the industry managing the terrain features for the snowboarders. So as wacky as the show might have been with all the other sports, it did feel like there was someone there that knew snowboarding and respected it. So speaking of big companies that come in and ruin it, I don't know. I think that they brought a lot of attention to the sport and they were instrumental in launching some people's careers. And at the time, it was big prize money compared to anything else. And yeah, I thought that they did pretty right by snowboarding. No, I think they did a great job. But I will say that like they were capitalizing on the sports because before the X Games, ESPN had nothing to do with any of these sports. And Ron Samio is like, hey, We can get all of this youth to come to our station and watch us and we can have a whole nother channel and we can base it all around X Games. And that's what happened and they owned it. So it's like they were team sports. They could care less about you until they realized they could get money off of you. And then they were like, hey, we're going to build something for Barrett. And it's great that they got all the right people involved because it makes it authentic and legitimate. But it's not like they had any ties to it before someone came up with an idea in a boardroom. But you win two medals at the first X Games. And does life change overnight? Like, is your parents now super proud of you being a snowboarder and everybody at home, like Doylestown, they want to write articles about you and shit has changed (laughs) for Barrett Christie? Yeah, that definitely shifted the tide a little bit. It was live TV then, too. And I remember calling up my mom afterwards to tell her what I did, you know, at a payphone in Big Bear. And she was like, I already saw it. And I couldn't believe I couldn't wrap my head around that. But yeah, it was kind of a launch point, I'd say. And I think at that point, they realized I wasn't going back to college anytime soon. And that may have legitimized it in their eyes, because now I was making money and I wasn't just talking about this thing I was doing that they had no visual on. They couldn't envision what that looked like or how I could possibly make money being a snowboarder. So are you able to like quit your job, get your own place and shower regularly? (laughs) <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I may have still been living with my friend Rhonda in her basement apartment in Vail. At that point, I may have moved out. I don't know. I traveled so much that I wasn't really spending much money on rent wherever I was living. Yep. And I lived with Todd Richards and his girlfriend at the time for some part of that time period. Jana Mayan was one of our roommates. So I always 
seem to have roommates. And then I don't remember what year it was, but I had saved a bunch of money and I put a down payment on and bought a place in Vail or in Good investment. In Edwards. And yeah, I kind of wish I would have held on to it or the other place I bought and sold in Vail. But yeah, those were good investments. And if it weren't for those early days and making the money then and making a few smart choices, then I wouldn't have anything saved. So I'm very grateful for that period. Now it's time for my final sponsor break. And Cole Headwear is new to the show, but not new to my life. Cole is a Seattle company that is made up of some of the raddest people I know. And on top of being rad, they make the best fitting beanies and hats out there, period. Nothing else comes close. Saying that may offend some other friends I have in the hat business, but honestly, when I make Powell Movement hats and beanies, I always go with the best, and the best is Cole. You know who else deserves the best? You do. And you shouldn't have to pay full price for it. So I'm going to save you 15% on everything Cole, and all you need to do is head on over to coleheadwear.com, go shopping, buy some stuff, and at checkout, enter the code POWELL15, that's all one word, all lowercase, and you'll save some money and help support the show. Last but not least is Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. For over 60 years, they have been getting people on the snow, in the water, and on the pavement. Not only have they provided a great retail experience, but they also play against the big internet guys. Over on their website, peterglenn.com, you'll find great brands, great products, and deals. Peter Glenn also offers shipping on orders over $49. They'll match the price found at other websites. If you need something ski, snowboard, wakeboard, or inline skate related, head on over to peterglenn.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. Jared, I love to talk about money, and I'm going to ask you a little bit about it. So we know that you got on Lib in the mid-90s, but then you transition over to GNU. You're still there 30 years later. So that's one sponsor that's also an employer. You bleed GNU, and that's like your favorite sponsor of all time, I would think. (laughs) Fair enough to say that? Yeah, I mean, it's family and it it always felt like not just a standard sponsor relationship. It was an opportunity to kind of join the family. And I know that term is thrown around so much now and it really bugs me, but it really feels like that was the case back then. And when I joined Mervyn or LibTech at the time, it was suddenly I got to know Jamie Lynn. I got to ride with Jamie Lynn, a hero. And got to ride with these powerful Northwest riders and then come to the office and give my opinion on graphics. And so it was just kind of getting pulled into the fold and that made it more than just a sponsor. Yep. And I think the whole family thing is a tired thing to hear about because right about now is when you find out if a brand is like a family. When the pandemic hits and they keep everybody working and they try to figure it out where it's like, hey, we're all going to take a little bit less, but we're all going to stay with the company. And that's how it's going to happen. That's when you know it's a family. When people lose jobs and there's no way of trying to help people and figure it out, I think that's where you realize it's a business. So yeah, family there. I think the one that's fun to talk about for me and probably anybody who talks to you is Nike because you're one of the horses when they come on for the whole ACG thing. And whenever Nike does something, they do it right. They throw a ton of money at it like ESPN. They hire the right people. They bring a lot of things in. They spend the money, they create the product, they create a ton of opportunities, they have an expectation of return on their investment as well. And so when they first announced they're coming into snowboarding, what do snowboarders think? Yeah, I mean, they came into snowboarding, they had Shannon Melhews, they had Matt Goodwill, Julie Zell, they were all great snowboarders and really cool people, but they didn't have like somebody that maybe was more into the culture of the sport, you know? And so they called me about joining them. They didn't have a contest rider, basically. And yeah. so... And the Olympics are coming up and they're like, we need someone on that podium. The culture is so much bigger than just contest riding. I don't want to say that. But, you know, they definitely, they had a whole, they had all their categories covered, but they didn't have somebody in the contest. And I did have like multiple conversations with them and I wasn't sold on it right away. I felt like, you know what? It might just be a bad move. I don't know. It's kind of weird. ACG was a little bit off and their styling and their clothes. And it it just didn't really seem to be like the stuff I wanted to wear. But they really sold me on it because like Mervyn, I mean, you couldn't get more opposite in terms of business structure. But Nike, they wanted the riders to be really involved. And they wanted 
my opinion on stuff and they invited me to work with the designers and all of us got to and we really had a hand in improving the product and so I said yes and you know obviously I had made the Olympic team and I did see the opportunity there of aligning with Nike going into a year like that so I'm glad I did because, I mean, that relationship lasted well beyond the ACG years at the time. And I mean, I had the best job at Nike in terms of I wasn't in the corporate world and I wasn't sitting at a desk and I wasn't really part of that employee base, but I was contracted for so long and got to come and bring team riders in or be a team rider myself and have a lot of say in how they shaped their category around snowboarding. So that was the best job I could have had there. And I'm grateful for it. But now ACG is cool again. They just brought it back. It's funny that they kill it back then or like the whole snowboard part of it, but they keep you. And for some reason, I feel like, did you have a shoe with them? I did. I had two years of an ACG signature shoe and I don't think it sold that well, but it was pretty cool. I've still got a few pairs. (laughs) Yeah, it's really, really cool to have a signature Nike shoe. So. They come into snowboarding, they promise a lot, they walk out of snowboarding, they piss a ton of people off, and you are not pissed off because they keep you on board, which is great for you, for snowboarding, whatever, and then eventually they do it again. They come in with 6.0, and it's the same thing. They hire a lot of the right people, they have amazing technology. This time, they're actually making stuff that looks really cool and is like on brand with what Nike snowboarding should be. And the potential to best the competition from day one. And is there any flags in the 6.0 days when you first start out there? No. And and yeah, that in between time, I got to be like just a women's fitness model. So like I just was women's fitness and I did some ads with training gear and running shoes. And so that was a nice chance to just sort of stay involved and not have to be pinned to anyone brand or category within Nike. Was that the commercial time too? Or is that after the... Yeah, I think that was. That was the commercial time because... And that might have been right at the end of ACG because I had the shoe then. And it was Peekaboo Street, Gabby Reese, and Carrie Walsh. Wait, the Suicide commercial? Yeah. Well, that series. So that whole season, there was a series. There were kind of funny scenes with Peekaboo and Gabby, and they all had their own scene. Gabby like ended up doing a volleyball overhead slam in a restaurant or something. It was always like just taking your sport out of its element. And the producer and the director on that project was really cool and creative and Nike put it together. So Nike's pretty good at commercials, huh? I don't know if they would do that today though. Cause it's like, <laughs> you've got a guy thinking of committing suicide, sitting on a building oh, I know. and then that you look so at him and kind of like, Hey, looks pretty big later and drop in or whatever you say. And, uh, it's really funny, <laughs> but I don't think they would make that these days just because of mental health and all the things that are going on in the world. But amazing yeah. that they did that back then. And then Nike pulls out of snowboarding again. I don't know if you're with Nike when they pull out again, but it's just a cycle of abuse from Nike towards the sport. It seems like snowboarding is the battered woman that keeps coming back saying they love us and they're going to make us some great product. And then Nike's like, the return's not good enough. We're out of here. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of abuse, I guess, in the end result. But I mean, every time they come into it, they bring a lot to the sport. I know they should just stay and just build on what they bring instead of stop and start and stop and start and stop and start because they can. They have the money to do it. Another brand that has a ton of money that you work with is Tag Heuer. And I would think they have some deep, deep pockets. And I would think for you to put your name on a Tag Heuer contract is kind of a weird one. And it would probably cost a lot of money because it just doesn't seem like totally on brand with you. Do you have a sick watch? Yeah, I still have a bunch of watches. That was a great sponsor. And you know what? That came about because I was part of the Vail snowboard team. They're the official timekeeper? Timekeeper for Vail. And so they kind of handpicked a couple of the riders and... Maybe as part of the Vail team, we all got watches, but I got to do some, you know, had a separate contract with them. And yeah, I got paid and got some watches and got my parents' watches. I think we had a watch allowance every year. And I think I gave one to my brother and one to each of my parents, but I hoarded as many watches as I could get my hands on. I love them. Except for now, it's so expensive to replace the batteries that they all have dead batteries and they don't work. But 
someday I'll fix them. <laughs> <laughs> you had Minx, a clothing brand that I think was a spinoff of Wave Rave. And at this point, there was hundreds of snowboard brands out there. So there's lots of travel, money, excitement. The Olympics are coming up. And who else pays the bills during the glory years? Or did we nail them there? Uh, you kind of nailed them. I had Oakley. They're a big one. But I think it was right before the, it may have been before the Olympics or after. Something went down between Oakley and Nike. And it had to do with Michael Jordan. And Oakley was not supposed to make footwear ever. It was a, it was like a handshake agreement between Phil Knight and whoever the Oakley guy was. And Oakley wasn't supposed to make footwear and Nike wasn't ever going to make eyewear. And then somebody broke the rules and Michael was involved with both companies and somebody broke the rules. And then it was like all shit hit the fan and any rider or any athlete, I mean, snowboarding was a tiny little blip on the screen, but any athlete that was represented by Oakley and Nike had to make a choice. And, you know, Nike was more head to toe for me. And so they bought me out of an Oakley contract and wanted me on Nike eyewear because they wanted all their Nike athletes to, to not be wearing a big O on their head. So Michael Jordan impacted your career. <laughs> so yeah, Michael and I had a lot of long discussions about it. No, <laughs> no I don't know why I mentioned my because I think it was like pretty uh, intense at the time between the two brands. And, and I know Michael was obviously involved with Nike heavily. And, and I believe he was also invested in Oakley. And so I think it had something to do with that. Somebody pissed someone off, their feelings got hurt. And then they both tried to take over each other's market share. And so everybody had to get off of their O if they had an O and they were on Nike. Okay. For a while, you were on top of the sport competition wise. You win back to back riders pole awards. You're moving the needle. I think you're filming and you're one of the best snowboarders in the world. Are you able to make like a half a million dollars a year being a professional snowboarder? Barely. I think one year I came close to that with prize money and incentives with some of those bigger sponsors. But not for very long. And really, I only did the competition thing for, it was 10 years. And it seems, you know, like that was a pretty important 10 years in snowboarding's history, just because it was coming from the unknown into a more mainstream lens on it. But I, I you know, I look at Jamie now, who's been doing this for 15, 20 years and continues to dominate well beyond the 10 year mark. And I mean, I only dominated for a few of those 10 years. And so there was a couple years that I made really good, I mean, more money than I needed. And luckily, I bought a house or two with it. And those were money in the bank. So I know these days, I am aware of what the top women make versus the top men. And it is frustrating that there's still not more women making anywhere near what the guys are making at the top. So if there's a dude near the top who's making, let's just say, three quarters of a million dollars, contest sponsorship all of that rolled up the equal girl in terms of results and brands what is she making half of that yeah i would say maybe half of that and that's because of the audis and the toyotas and the you know outside sponsors i don't think any of the snowboard sponsors are in a position these days to be spending that much money on athletes but yeah i mean you know it goes beyond the contest results it's their marketability but it does seem like we haven't caught up at the rate that I would have expected by now. If somebody asked me this when I was at my peak earning potential. Well, let's see. That's all I really need to talk about with money because we're oh, going good. for a while. Yeah, you know, but I do <laughs> like to talk about it. But with you, you've been on every important podium, it seems like from 97 to 2002. And you're expected to be in the Olympics when it's the Olympic year. And you don't straight up qualify. You're given a coach's decision to get in. On paper, it's like you should have been a shoe-in for making the team and getting a medal just based off of your history. But what was going on leading up to the games? Were you just not in the right zone? Yeah, I know. I was definitely excited and committed to go into the Olympics. But, I mean, it all came up so fast. It wasn't like we had four years to prepare, wrap our heads around it, mentally, you know, join the games. It was definitely like, oh, I won the U.S. Open the spring before, you know, and then I knew that we were getting points to qualify for Olympics. Then I really started thinking, oh, I could do this. So all the qualifiers happen in the months leading up to the Olympics. 
And somehow between the open and the next season, I just got shaky and I wasn't a shoe and I didn't have the confidence. I didn't feel like I had, you know, I didn't feel like I was dominant in any way in the pipe. So it's in your head. So it was in my head. And, you know, we get there and up to that point, we had the X Games. That was the first and only like big media event I had done and most of us had experienced. And that didn't even compare to the Olympics and the intensity level of that media experience. And yeah, I just did think that I was just really unprepared for it. Obviously, some people thrived in that scenario and did really well. And I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It just felt so foreign. It didn't feel like that culture and community that I thrived on in snowboard events and did well when I had was surrounded by that. But then the Olympics was something just completely different. And instead of like feeding off of it, I just kind of felt buried by it. Yeah. And so I felt like I had one more shot at it, the next Olympics and came back from that and got my head back on straight and did well in some events. And then I got hurt before the qualifiers for the 2002. So that really took me out of that running. Yeah. I mean, you know, in just thinking about it, though, it's like you didn't make the team straight up. It was like you and Bjorn Lines, and they had to pick one or two of you. And it's funny because when he doesn't go to the Olympics, his career just explodes in a totally different direction. Contests are in the past after not getting selected to the Olympic team. But with yeah. you, you get picked. But it sounds like leading up to it, it was in your head. It's not like you got to Nagano and were like overwhelmed. It was like all fall and early contest season. You just didn't have it for some reason in your head. And it's not because he lost it because he went on to win a ton more contests after that. It was just like six months of not riding at your best. And it happened to be the most important six months of your career if you're interested in the Olympics. Yeah, I think about, I mean, we had a snowboard coach because as part of going to the Olympics, I became part of the U.S team for that period of time but I wasn't part of the U.S. team going into it and I wasn't part of the U.S. team after it obviously I had a good relationship with the coaches and all the riders but what the team does and makes available to athletes now it makes total sense because they have sports psychologists and they have a lot of training and preparation mentally and physically up to the games and all of my training was Certainly no mental training. I did some yoga and felt like I was pretty confident, but clearly I didn't have the mental strength that I needed to get there at the Olympics. But there's so much more to it. And now I see that and looking past it now, it's like, yeah, I would advise anyone in that position to take full advantage of any like sports psychology and any real physical training methods you can get into because it makes all the difference to show up and be 120% at the top. You have that let down and I'm sure it bums you out for a bit, but then you go to other contests and you're like right back on the podium. And is it kind of like, what happened? Is it just weird? Like you got it back? (laughs) No, I knew I was a head trip. I knew that it wasn't my riding, but it was, I also felt like I couldn't really do much worse than failing at the Olympics. I felt like, okay, well, I handled that and I can come back from that and physically I can still do what I want to do. So I'm just going to give it my all at these other events. And, you know, because I didn't start snowboarding until I was 19, I was well into my late 20s before I stopped competing. And I felt like I was an adult. I I also had a little bit of self-protection at that point. I got to the age where I was like, oh, I might want to have kids someday and I want to do more with my body than just throw it off a jump. So, yeah, I think I was handling it smartly but yeah I might have sacrificed a few podiums along the way because I didn't want to get hurt too well the thing is you were never washed up it was just one bad event and whatever but I think when we look at all the events you do maybe not the most important financially for you but probably mentally is bank slalom I mean that's a different event in snowboarding it's 2001 and not only do you win but I think your boyfriend wins that year as well and what does the bank slalom mean to you Yeah, the first one I did was in 95. I don't think I went every year through the late 90s, but for some of those years I did. And then it was always an escape. So it was always like a fun place to compete. Like your board didn't have to leave the ground. You weren't being judged. It was just the clock. And Crested Butte reminded me a little bit of Mount Baker. And when I finally got to Baker, I was like, this is the kind of mountain I want to ride. And it just had natural terrain features and 
bunch of steeper sections and shelves. And so just the chance to go there for a contest, take your one run a day and then ride the mountain was always a highlight. And anytime I could get it in between other contests, it felt like a total relief to be there. I mean, that year, Victoria was beating me all weekend. And she obviously was someone I always looked up to and definitely felt like she was the one to beat anyway. And it came down to the final time on the final day. And so I was so excited to finally win a pro women's medal. I had gotten second and third a few times, but to win a gold and then to have Temple win it too was pretty cool. And we lived happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to go to the X Games the next day and you clean up there. Then you go on and win the ESPN Action Sports and Music Festival's Female Athlete of the Year. And there's so much more to talk about, which we're not going to. I mean, there's the Baker Road Gap with Brad Holmes competing at X Games Pregnant, leaving the pro side of snowboarding, transitioning to a desk, what that entails, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to touch any of that. We're going to go into a segment that I like to call inappropriate questions. And (laughs) the deal here is I get someone that you know to ask you three questions and they can be anything. And I got Trisha Burns to ask the questions this week. Normally, I record Trisha asking the questions. I play them back to you. I think there was miscommunication in our email, so she just sent me her questions. And I can't say they're very inappropriate, so I am going to try to spin them into some inappropriate questions. But you can imagine me reading as Trisha Burns, and we'll pretend like she has a deep voice. And here's Trisha's (laughs) first question. She's such an icon in snowboarding and a pioneer in women's sports. I'd be curious, what would she be doing if she wasn't continuing to be an advocate for snowboarding and women's representation in it, and what advice does she have for the next generation of up-and-comers, regardless of gender? Oh, that is not inappropriate. Yeah, we're not going to answer that, so Thank I'm going to spin you, that Trisha. into something else. <laughs> so you are in a male-dominated industry, and regardless of gender, when you're in a male-dominated industry, especially in like the 90s, there's got to be some sexist shit that happens in your career. What is the most awful or ridiculous thing that someone said to you because you're a woman? Like, you can't go on this trip because you can't hang or something like that. Oh, my gosh. You really spun that question to mean something totally different. I'm good. I'm good. (laughs) Oh, God. Um, What is the most? I don't know. I mean, there was plenty of times when it was like, you know, I just didn't get the invite and it was just for the boys. and you know, girls can't go. But I also grew up thinking I was a tomboy. And that even that term sounds so whack these days, because to describe a girl who's athletic and into action sports as being a tomboy is like, why do you have to insert the word boy in there? It's just a girl who's strong and adventurous. And so I liked hanging with the boys and they were often my good friends and I learned a lot from them. And so when I didn't get an invite to go on a trip because they already had their token girl on the trip, which is just one example of sexism and tokenism, and that would hurt my feelings. But I wouldn't say that it, I can't, I can't even think of a specific example. It's just that that would often happen. There'd always be a token girl. And once that role was filled, then you had to move on and find your other token place. All right. Well, we will go with question number two, and I'm sure I'm going to have to spin this one as well. But here is Trisha's <laughs> second question. Who would you trade careers with in snowboarding? So not inappropriate. We're not going to have you answer that. And I will jump in with a question number two from her. And there are two old school legendary couples in snowboarding. There is Shannon Dunn and Dave Downing. There is Temple Cummins and Barrett Christie Cummins. Who is the more talented couple on a snowboard? (laughs) That's there is a lot more than two out there. Well, that's just what came uh, to my head in this spinning this question. (laughs) Um, Well, I got to ride with Shannon not this past season, but the season before it. It's tits up at Timberline, boarding for breast cancer event and. Shannon absolutely rips. I mean, she surfs every day. She snowboards a lot still, or even if she doesn't snowboard a lot, she hasn't lost it and can still do a method and can still move her body in ways that make her look like she's 20 years younger and on a snowboard. And so I haven't ridden with Dave in years, but I'd say Temple probably rides more than Dave. So the scales would tip maybe towards Temple on that side. You're not going to get me to pick 
opinion. I, I don't know. Those guys surf way more than we do, so they're probably in better shape. <laughs> All right. We will go with our final inappropriate question. Who's in your cat on your perfect bald face trip? But to spin this to make it inappropriate, who are the two people that you have gotten to know over your career in snowboarding that you would least like to have in your cat at your bald face trip? Oh, my God. That is totally inappropriate. I know. Well, it's inappropriate questions. If it was appropriate questions, we would go with whatever Trisha asked. Well, I don't. I. You don't even have to throw anybody out. I'm just going to try to let you hang and, and do it. But if you don't want to, I mean. You're just going to let me sit here and be uncomfortable with the thought for a while, huh? Yeah, but I mean, really, if someone asked me to do that, I probably would say two people. But they would be two people that I hate and wish terrible things upon. And I can't think of them right now. Okay, well, um, can I say I don't want to go snowboarding with Donald and Mel- Melania? Yeah, yeah. Well, they ski, I think. But yeah, you don't want to go with them. Yeah, it'd be super embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to go with them or any of their family members. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. So that's inappropriate questions. And that's about it with the podcast. And I will say, when I was just a young kid, I was living in Vail, Colorado, working at Buzz's Boards. And I think you were living in Colorado, maybe Vail at that time too. And every once in a while, we would see a Barrett Christie. She'd drop in and go huge, had great style. We wouldn't even know it was you. We'd be like, who was that? And then someone would be like, that's Barrett Christie. And we'd be like, whoa, that's a girl. That's incredible. And you were a hero to guys as well as girls back then. And I'm confused with why I even bring gender into it anymore anyway, because I really don't need to. But really, a privilege to be able to see you back then when I was just a kid and be able to talk to you now. So I thank you for your time and all you've done. Well, thank you. That makes me feel good. Thanks for all the appropriate and inappropriate questions. (laughs) And you did your research. You had most of the facts pretty straight. I mean, you probably have a better idea of the timeline than I do because it's all a little blurry now. So that was time with Barrett Christie. And normally I would have a full on outro where I would tell you all about the podcast and my thoughts of it. But my head is in just a crazy place right now. And I barely even remember this interview. So Barrett, I know, was an entertaining one. I think there was some hippie stuff in her early life. And she was one of those snowboarders that I had her poster on my wall as well. It didn't matter if she was a guy or a girl. Back in that era, it was like everyone was just a rider, and that's all that mattered. And I don't know what happened to snowboarding along the way and how some kind of model parts came into it, but it seems like it's getting back to its roots. But that's me, just a middle-aged white male, saying that to have to ask some of the young females how equality is in snowboarding, and I need to get more females on the show. That is something that I have sucked at lately, and I will be working my hardest to do that because it's 2020, and I can't be a dick and just have guys on my show all the time. That's the podcast for this week. At this point, I want to ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. If you're on an iPhone, here's what you need to do. First, hit your podcast icon, then search for the Powell Movement, click my logo, scroll down to where you see the stars, click five stars, and you're done. It's very easy. It's very appreciated. And what else? I don't even know what else I have to say. What else do I need to ask you to do? Well, I want you to support my amazing sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Stanley, Peter Glenn, Ski and Sports, Cole Headwear, and the Ten Barrel Brewery. Have a great week, everyone.